Hello, my name is Herb Douglas, and I've been asked to introduce Robert Whelan, a living legend in our time. We have had many requests from hundreds of thousands of people around the world to nail down certain aspects of history that have become very special to the Adventist denomination, and it focuses upon the year 1888. And like 1844, these are two dates that are really embedded in Adventist history. And people want to know why this particular date, 1888, has become so important in the history of the denomination and to them today. And so that's our focus. And so I introduce to you Robert Whelan, a minister of 45 years, written 25 books or so, and we welcome you, Bob. Thank you, thank you. What have you been doing for 45 years? Well, it's more than 45. It goes all the way back to 1929. Were you always an Adventist? No, I was born into a Lutheran home. And then we moved to, a, my family moved to a town where there was no Lutheran church, and we went to the Presbyterian church, and I discovered the Sabbath truth in the Presbyterian Sunday school. All right. That's a story. And I took my stand for the Sabbath, and I was the only Adventist boy in my high school for four years. So I started off having battles. Friday night? Yep. I played the violin fairly well back in those days. I, they asked me to come and play for a party or something. I couldn't do it. Couldn't go to any of the, any of the ball games. I was sticking out like a sore thumb continually all through high school. Then in my senior year, the, the faculty asked me to represent our high school in the Florida State Academic Contests. And uh, for English and English literature, and I won first place in the state of Florida. Good news. And that gave me two scholarships. To? Stetson University and to University of Florida, Gainesville. But? But I had a sort of a godfather, vice president of the General Conference, who had known me when I was a boy. And he got me off immediately to Southern Junior College to keep me out of those two universities. No scholarship. And there I worked hauling wet cement in a wheelbarrow and 23 other jobs to work my way through college that I might learn how to be a missionary. So you graduated in? I graduated in 1939. And you went on to what job? Well, big story. There was no job. <laughs> there was no job. Depression years. No, that wasn't a problem. That wasn't the problem. I had already discovered the 1888 message. How did that happen? Well, it was my senior year in college. Our Bible teacher, Lindsay A. Simmons, oh, yes. had known Ellen White personally in Australia. And he told us one day that the, the, the most famous evangelist that we had, who always dressed in a white suit and had a spotlight on him and baptized people by the hundreds, didn't understand the two covenants. And that shocked me. I asked him, well, if, if Elder so-and-so doesn't understand the two covenants, who does? And he looked up at the ceiling and he rolled his eyes around and said, well, I don't know who does. I said, well, where can we learn about it? And I checked him out on that recently. I went to the library and I got the, the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald volume for 1939 and read through the entire thing. There was nothing there about the new covenant, really. I said, well, who does? Where can we learn about it? He said, well, the best he'd ever read was in a book called The Glad Tidings by E.J. Wagoner. And so he brought the book and put it on reserve for us, and I read it. I was John Wesley in that little chapel in Aldous Great Street, Aldous Great Street in London, hearing someone read Luther on Romans, my heart was strangely warmed.
I had discovered the gospel as I'd never understood it. You see, in high school, with all these battles over the Sabbath, my high school principal got annoyed with me. They said, Robert, you ought to read the book of Galatians. That'll straighten you up on the Saturday business. And I read Galatians, but I couldn't understand it. I went to camp meeting every year, church every Sabbath. Nobody ever explained Galatians for me. No minister? No. No teacher? Never heard a sermon about Galatians. And then what happened? When I read that book, I understood something at least of what the gospel really is. That's how I got started. And somehow because of my early glimpse of the 1888 message, which I can't tell you now, I, I was not placed. Something happened. You don't know about this. But they didn't understand me. And they thought I was maybe a kook or something. And I couldn't go out and get into business because I'd given my heart and my life to the Lord to be a missionary. All I could do is go out and sell books, Cole Porter, which I was not very famous at. Finally, a general conference publishing director came through and found me and said, you ought to be in the ministry. And my godfather, Elder Oliver Montgomery, was the vice president of the general conference. Right. He told me, Robert, go down to the general conference president and tell him you just simply have to have a place. You know you're divinely called to the ministry. You've got to have a place. Well, I couldn't do that. I didn't want to pull any strings to get into ministry. I went down and told him, I'm available if you want me. And he finally invited me to be a tent master. Do you know what that is? I understand. I was one once. Were you? Oh, yes. The lowest rung of the ladder. Peoria, Illinois. Yeah. And uh, I could take my choice, $6 a week and also call Porter. Or $12 a week full-time. I grabbed the full-time. <laughs> that was pretty good. <laughs> and that's how I got started into, into the ministry, thank the Lord. And then? Well. First church? First church was uh, St. Augustine, Florida, and Bunnell in Palatka, a little district. How long did you church. stay there? I was there about nine months, and then we were called to Africa. Now, this is amazing. You're called to Africa to do what? just to be a lower-level missionary to work in Uganda. What year was this? That we were called, we left, went there in 1945. And when you got there, what kind of an organization was it? Did you fit in? Somebody tell you what to do, or what did, what did you do? Yes, we had a mission director for the Uganda mission who instructed me what to do and uh, took me to my little mission station at Kokoro in eastern Uganda and left both of us there. One reason I wanted to go to Africa was because the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald had been publishing articles about Rwanda and Kenya stating that the latter rain was falling because of the huge baptisms that were taking place. And I wanted to see this. And when I got there, the general conference had a little book that they gave you. And the little book said, you're going out to Africa for life. Not just for seven years. Settle down, learn the language, get to know the people. And I did that. Got to know the people, and I discovered these people, this was not the latter rain. And you learned their language, too, by the way. Yes, I did. I learned two languages out there. The honest truth, if, I want, if you want me to tell it, the honest truth is those dear people were Seventh-day Baptists. They had no idea of the sanctuary message, no understanding of what justification by faith really is. And Uganda became the AIDS capital of the world. I got into some horrible messes. The, the British District Commissioner had to write me a letter 
and say, I'm sorry, Mr. Whelan, to inform you that your mission teacher is having carnal relations with the girls. It was a plague. And what could I do? I, I wish I could go home. Why was I giving my life to this kind of a situation here? It was a disaster. And how did this lead you to understand or how to apply um, the new covenant, shall we say? Well, I discovered that discipline wasn't going to help. These dear people had to understand the gospel. Amen. And I was forced to study. Well, there came a, a counterfeit movement that swept through the Protestant church in Rwanda and infiltrated the Church of England mission in Uganda. And from there, it came into our own little Seventh-day Adventist church in Uganda. It was from the Oxford group movement. And it was, it, it seemed to bring revival and bring joy and, and self-esteem that seemed to make people happy. And at first I thought it was a good thing until somebody, well, they, they were telling you that you, ordinary Christians were on a lower level, but the real Christians were on a higher level. They were the ones who said, we are saved. I am saved. Hallelujah. And they would sing a little song, to the tender residue of Mona Gwendy God, dance a little jig. They were now on this higher level. And someone pointed out to me that the book Christ Object Lessons tells us never to think or to say, I'm saved. This is misleading. And I realized I was mistaken. And I got to work to study. And the more I studied, the more I realized what these people un need to understand is what happened on the cross. How long were you in uh, Uganda? We were not there long, three years, and then through some mysterious providence, uh, we were given the opportunity to go home in furlough. We'd gone out for seven years, but technically we were under the Northern European Division, which gave you only three and a half years, and then a six-month furlough, <laughs> and we chose that. But I had to meet this fanatical movement there and I discovered the idea of agape that I'd never learned about in college. Agape meaning? The love of Christ constrains us. Second Corinthians 5. That's 14. the Greek word, agape. The Greek word, agape. And I, I discovered, uh, what I, I'd found this book by Andrews Negrin, Agape and Eros. Some missionary was going home to England and was selling his books and I had to pay a shilling for it. And it was over my head. I, I couldn't understand it at first, <laughs> but I took it with me in my long safaris out in the bush and studied until I finally got the idea. And I began to preach that to the Africans. And what happened on the cross, what Jesus did for us, how he justified the whole world by his sacrifice. And I also had discovered from the 1888 message of reading the glad tidings that Christ in his incarnation took our fallen sinful nature. Which means I could tell these people in Uganda, Christ was tempted like you are. Yes, he was tempted sexually as are men as well. And he condemned sin in fallen, sinful flesh. Romans 8, 4. Romans 8, 4. And I began to preach that. And the Lord blessed. For the first time, I saw tears streaming down the cheeks of Africans. Because? As I preached about what happened on the cross, their hearts were melting. Something was happening. Now, I didn't turn the world upside down. I'm not saying that. But I did discover that the preaching of the cross does impact human hearts. 
Then we went home on furlough. And so I'll tell you what happened. Obviously. You well, didn't go out to plant potatoes. I went to the seminary, our theological seminary, which was then in Tacoma Park, and enrolled in the class in righteousness by faith. Because? I wanted to learn about it. The instructor was a marvelous individual. At, at, I'd never heard him preach before. He was only a 33, and I was only a 33. And at first I thought, this man is our Joshua. He's going to lead us into the promised land. This is absolutely marvelous. But after a week or 10 days, I began to see some things that didn't stack up, things that bothered me. And it finally dawned on me what I was meeting was the same kind of theology I had to meet out there in Uganda. Interesting. And I went to the instructor, and I, I had a visit with him and told him what my convictions were becoming. And uh, he did not receive me. And finally, well, what happened was he was recommending the books of E. Stanley Jones. Now, I that's know those books. a previous generation. I know those books. But E. Stanley Jones was the Rick Warren of, of that generation. The great evangelical leader. And I got the books of E. Stanley Jones to see what he was saying. And he was offering a little prayer. It was a devotional book. Oh, God. I shall love myself in thee today, for love of self is love of God. That woke me up. And he also tells how he went to the grave of his grandmother and communed with her there at mm. her grave. And all the way through, this idea of self-esteem, what does... Christianity do with this primary urge of self? Crucify it? No. The self is to be affirmed. The self is worthy of love. That so this was not received too well in your little class in Christ Our Righteousness? Well, with me it wasn't received too well. I, I got some red lights flashing that, that disturbed me, and I went to the president. And he did not take kindly to what I said. And that started for me these 50-some years of trial and often misunderstanding, what you referred to a little while ago. I understand from a recently circulated manuscript that a manuscript which became a book that you were writing at that time precipitated the 1952 Bible Conference, which was quite an international deal. It was. Now, w what was that book? Well, the Southern African Division had appointed Donald K. Short and myself to be delegates to the 1950 General Conference session in San Francisco. And Short was? Donald K. Short was the mission director of the largest mission station in Africa at the time. We had traveled over together on the boat. So we got acquainted. We talked a little bit. We weren't special friends at all. But um, both of us were opposed to government grant being received to support our schools. Both of us opposed baptizing huge numbers of people without instructing them. We more or less had the same convictions about mission work. And when I got to the 1950 General Conference session, we attended all of the meetings of the pre-session, which was on Christ-centered preaching. I listened carefully, and it dawned on me 
that the Christ-centered preaching we were hearing was the theology of the Sunday-keeping evangelical churches on righteousness by faith and not what God gave us in 1888. I missed one little point there. Before I left the seminary, I went by the White Estate to ask if I could see what Ellen White had to say about 1888. Arthur White was away. He was in South Africa, but D.E. Robinson was in charge. And he said, well, no, we don't usually let people in to read those materials because they're rather controversial. And I didn't leave, I just stood there. And he said, well, why do you want to know? I said, well, I've been in this seminar and I've heard some things that are self-contradictory. I'd like to know what Ellen White says. Well, he said, who are you? I said, I am the president of the Uganda Mission. Oh, I know your son Virgil. We're members together of the East African Union Committee. Oh, well, come in. And then he brought me a file containing much of the material, that's very significant at least, that's in those four huge volumes that are now published, you know, 1888 materials. I was reading her diary, her letters, documents that gave an entirely different picture than what I was getting in the seminary. Mm. I well know. And I said, may I copy? He said, yes, if you don't publish. I said, I have no intent to publish. So I brought my little portable typewriter in and I typed like mad till five o'clock. And uh, I said, may I take this home overnight, bring it back tomorrow? Oh, no, it must go back in the vault. You can finish tomorrow. But tomorrow he wouldn't give it back to me. But he didn't ask for my notes back. And those notes became the basis for a manuscript we wrote for the General Conference Committee entitled 1888 Re-Examined. We presented that to the General Conference Brethren in September, on September 16, 1950. We gave them 16 copies. If you could have visited the General Conference offices for the next week, you would have found the Brethren reading that manuscript. That's what this brother referred to. That precipitated discussion back and forth, pro and con, which finally led to the 1952 Bible Conference. That was the background. And they did have some speakers on that point of what we mean by Christ's righteousness. Yes, there were. And there was a clear presentation of the two covenants at the 1952 session. That is right. And what happened then? You well, must have been sort of exonerated. No, I don't think so, because in 1950, the, the brethren, uh, when, they, when they read the manuscript, they knew that we were loyal to the church. They had been afraid that we were not loyal, see. They thought we were going to be troublemakers or something like that. And when they read 1888 Reexamined, they knew definitely, yes, we are absolutely loyal to this church. They sent us back to Africa with their blessing, but asked us not to teach the 1888 message, <laughs> but go back and preach righteousness by faith. I think they meant the evangelical version. But in 1951, they responded negatively to our manuscript and asked us not to circulate it. Meanwhile, some copies, we had sent a few copies, we had been to Grafton, see, and we sent a few copies to close personal friends, and they lent it out, and it got out, and it became controversial, until finally in 1987, we revised it and we published it as a book. So that's the background 
of, of 1888. Do you have any details, significant details, between 52 and the 70s, shall we say? Did it, did it affect you in any way as far as correspondence that you had with general conference leadership? We had constant correspondence back and forth with the general conference. We received letters that were very critical, strongly opposing the theological positions that we had gleaned from the actual writings of Jones and Wagoner. You were sort of uh, teetering back and forth as to whether you really should bow out and preach Daniel 2 or something, but you kept on focusing on what you thought was that message that the Seventh-day Adventist Church needed and the world needed as to what kind of a God is running this universe, what kind of a God was that would die in the cross, and what did it all mean to us as far as getting ourselves ready to be translated, shall we say? Right. I had the conviction all along that God had sent the 1888 message specifically to prepare a people for translation in their generation. Can you, can you give us an overview, bird's eye view, of what we mean by the 1888 message? The 1888 message is most precious, Ellen White said. Those are the words. The two young messengers whom the Lord sent with the message had heavenly credentials, she said. Their understanding of justification by faith went far beyond that of Luther and Calvin. Interesting. Or the evangelicals of that day. And the reason is, Jones and Wagoner, although they were young, they were in their 30s, managed to combine together the unique idea, Adventist idea, of the cleansing of the sanctuary with Paul's idea of justification by faith. And by putting those two doctrines together, Jones and Weiger discovered what we call the 1888 message. Therefore, it was something that the evangelicals, the Sunday-keeping evangelicals, just couldn't grasp because they had no idea of the sanctuary message. When you say sanctuary message in, context, in connection here with justification by faith, what is it that has much to do or anything to do with getting us ready for heaven? Because the sanctuary in heaven can never be cleansed until, first of all, the hearts of God's people are cleansed. In other words, we're kind of like this sanctuary that God is concerned about. No, there's a sanctuary in heaven. There's a literal sanctuary in heaven. But the high priest can never succeed in cleansing that sanctuary of the record of our sins until, first of all, those sins have been eradicated from the human heart. And so it's not a, a matter of sinning and repenting and coming back next Sabbath and repenting all over again, and then going back and sinning some more. And the general idea in the church today, I'm sorry to say, is that it's impossible to really overcome sin per se. The best you can do is to keep on repenting. And just tell everybody that Jesus paid it all anyhow. Yes. So that's the evangelical. I'm trying to get the difference between what you say, Wagner and Jones were saying, and the evangelical church has been saying. The evangelical church is saying, Jesus forgives you and you go on and sin some more because you can never really overcome sin per se. Jones and Wagoner said, the, doc the Adventist doctrine of the cleansing of the sanctuary means it is possible to overcome even as Christ overcame. Ah. It is possible for a generation to prepare to be translated. And that's biblical? Jones and Wagner said it's biblical. 
I am thoroughly convinced it is biblical. It is a teaching of this holy book. Can you give us a text that would say that clearly? Yes. Maybe Revelation? To him, well, 321. we're starting here with a little Bible study, apparently. Revelation chapter 3. Chapter 3, and here, To him who overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne. In other words, What's the next phrase? Even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. Now this tells us something tremendous here. For one thing, it's possible to overcome even as Christ overcame. Number two, it tells us that Christ overcame. In other words, Christ had a constant battle with self as we have a battle with self. And whereas we, we give in to self, we yield to self-will, Jesus never did. He always condemned sin in our fallen sinful flesh. And number three, those who overcome are going to be invited to partake with Christ in the closing events of human history. They are going to be invited to sit with him in his throne, apparently, as members somehow of the heavenly um, congress or parliament. They will have a responsibility in bringing to a close the great controversy between Christ and Satan. I'd like to get into that later when we have a little more time for that. But have there been any uh, church leaders who have supported you through these years? Back in the 50s, shall we say? Well, we have had numerous um, ad hoc committees appointed by the General Conference. I mean, back there in the 50s when you're a young man and you just felt, whoa, am I against the whole world here? Am I, am I going off on some tangent? Was there anybody who could give you some that spiritual help? That is exactly how I felt. And uh, when I was asked to leave the seminary, Grace and I were deeply distressed. We thought our life work was ruined. But as time went on, on this spiritualism issue and E. Stanley Jones, I took a stand. I even wrote to the General Conference president telling what I'd found because the ministry magazine was recommending that Adventist ministers all around the world I remember should that. study E. Stanley Jones. We can't go along with him on the ecumenical issues, but we can certainly go with him on this issue of righteous by faith. He understands it clearly. It'll help you preach righteous by faith. And yet, he was teaching spiritualism. True. And it burdened me. I understand. And. Uh, Finally, I discovered, that, oh yes, the, the, his most recent book was entitled The Way to Power and Poise. Mm -hmm. I got the book and I read it. That's where I found these prayers. Oh God, I shall love self because love of self is love of God and so on. Then an old man, retired Adventist minister, former General Conference President, William A. Spicer, Decent man. used to write a little editorial every week for the review. And he wrote one warning against Eastern mysticism infiltrating Adventist thinking. And the key word is poise. Hmm. I put two plus two together. And I came up with a little letter to W.A. Spicer. Could you have had reference to E. Stanley Jones's new book? And he wrote me back, yes. And I told him what I had found in the book. And he wrote me back a handwritten letter he said, Dear Brother Whelan, thank God you saw the evil in that book. I regard E. Stanley Jones as doing the worst work of any modern religious agent. If others would protest as you have done, it might do some good. And I fired a letter back. I said, Elder Spicer, I'm nobody. I can't protest. Why don't you protest? You're somebody. He wrote me back. He said, I will. 
but not until after the J.C. session. Everybody was thinking about that. They wouldn't read it. And he did that summer. Yes, I did have support from W.A. Spicer, the granddaddy of all Adventist ministers. No question about that. A wonderful man. Yeah. Spicer College is named after him there in India. Now down to the 70s now. Well, we had some ad hoc committees. It seemed that the General Conference Brethren couldn't let go of this issue. Right. They kept writing letters to us and uh, putting pressure on us. And, uh, well, the problem is that 1888 re-examined found its way to Australia and stirred up some controversy there. We had nothing to do with it, but it was stirred up, and the brethren were distressed about it, and they were hoping that we could retract or take it back or something to, to silence people protesting. Yes, and for that reason, various ad hoc committees were called. There was one called in 1972, quite a large committee composed of the intelligentsia of our scholarly world and of general conference leadership. And uh, both Short and I were there, and we were grilled. The, the meeting lasted all week long. And this will surprise you. The brethren came down there on the Holy Sabbath day and opened those general conference offices that that committee might continue Sabbath afternoon. They were so disturbed about this matter. And you asked, did, I have any, did we have any support? Well, the whole committee, it was quite a large group, were totally opposed to us, oh. except two. There were two men who got up in the morning early and uh, rewrote what they understood was our thesis, and they supported us beautifully. Remember, I was there. I, I saw was the about whole thing. to tell who those two were. <laughs> One was Mervyn Maxwell, <laughs> the son of Uncle Arthur, and the other was Herbert Douglas. Interesting time. But we had some general conference vice presidents who really were supporting us. But they may not have wanted to get far out ahead. They didn't come out of the closet. Right. But they were supporting us. And yes, today we have many pastors who are supporting us. There's one who is a pastor of the uh, Hayward Church right here in Northern California who supports us beautifully. He's done some marvelous writing. And there's another pastor of the Oakhurst Church who is a member of our little committee. And there are pastors scattered here and there who openly identify oh, with yeah. us. But there are many pastors who read our writings and say amen, and their hearts respond and they believe, but they haven't gotten out of the closet yet. But I believe they're on the way. The Lord is working. And I have absolute confidence that the Lord is going to bring this church to the place of repentance and acceptance of this most precious message. Now, Bob, we've been saying for over 150 years that the Lord is near. His coming is at the door. Are we having trouble with English? How can anything be near even at the door for 150 years? Have we been wrong? I wish 12 or 13 million people would ask that question around the world. I wish our people in North America, where the movement began, would stop and think about what you have just said. Can we go on for another 500 or 1,000 years, keep saying, the Lord's coming is near? Doesn't make sense. Ellen White declared that if the 1888 message had been accepted by general conference leadership, the Lord 
could have come by 1893. You ask me where it is? That's the 1893 General Conference Bulletin, page 419. And she said it many times. At least 40 times that I know about. That's right. And finally, after the turn of the century, she had to declare we may have to remain in this world for many more years because of our insubordination to the Lord. And I happen to believe time enough has gone on. I don't see any point in continuing to be a world-loving, lukewarm, self-esteeming church body for another 25 or 50 years. I don't see the point in waiting that long. Is God waiting for the world to get worse and he kind of adding up all the wickedness and when it gets too much, then he's going to come anyhow? I hope we don't have to wait that long. Well, is that the way he thinks? Well, I, I can't believe that the Bible picture and Ellen White's understanding of the finishing of God's work that Christ as the heavenly bridegroom is going to have to knock his bride-to-be down and grab her by the hair and drag her to the altar. I can't see that that's the picture in the Bible. Well, does the Bible say anything about why God waits? Yes. In Revelation 19, verses 7 and 8, we read of those grand hallelujah choruses, four of them there. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is, is come for his wife has made herself ready. Therefore, the only reason why the Lord Jesus has not yet come is because his bride-to-be has not made herself ready. Now, the, John says a lot about the sealing of that group of people. Yes. Interesting words. And something about it in Revelation 7, perhaps, that may tie into what you just said. In Revelation 7, you read about four angels who are commissioned <coughs> to hold the four winds of strife until we have sealed the servants of our God in the forehead. And there were 144,000 sealed, which I hope is a symbolic and not a literal number. Now, are you saying that God is holding back the natural entropy of evil and the continuing misery in this world? He's holding much of it back because he hasn't got enough people to seal? Yes. Now that's a profound answer when you say yes. And not only enough people sealed, it may be is anybody sealed as yet? I don't know. But you, you and I couldn't drive home safely on the freeway unless the Lord was holding those four winds of strife a little longer. But who are these people? Do we have any kind of description of what kind of people he's trying to seal? Well, when they are sealed, we have a description, yes. In their mouth is found no guile. Where are you getting that? They are without fault before the throne of God. That's not in that's Revelation not me. 7. That's not in Revelation That's not Ellen White. That's, that's the Bible. That's Revelation 14, uh. verses 4 and 5. A group of people who overcome even as Christ overcame, who follow him whithersoever he goeth wherever truth leads wherever the truth leads self is crucified with christ is that what means, sealing means is that what sealing means that god I believe says it. i can put my stamp of approval upon you that's right i can trust you there are people who are crucified with christ in other words to me it says they are people who have finally understood what happened on the cross when Jesus died. What does he write in their foreheads? He writes the Father's name. Ah, wouldn't that be wonderful to have him write his signature on anyone's forehead? It'll be done. 
these are my people, you can trust them. I hope it's not going to be a literal number. I figured up one time, you know, uh, how if, if it's a literal number, that would be 1.7 people from the whole of Placid County in California. Not much chance for us to get into the group. I hope it's 144,000 categories of people who overcome. But it could be a first fruits too. Yeah. In other words, there's something about the 1888 message that can speed up this process of getting people sealed so that God can say, we finally have come to the place where the plan of salvation has been vindicated. I believe it. The message was sent for that very purpose, but it was not well received. Because what were they afraid of? Well, there, were, there was a, a number of factors involved. For one thing, the leadership of the church were gray-haired men. And the two messengers who brought this most precious message were young men. Watch it. We're gray-haired now. I know it, which means you and I are in a very dangerous position because it's old men who make stupid mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> my constant prayer is, oh, Lord, please, I'm praying Psalm 71. Oh, Lord, now that I'm old, old and gray-haired, do not forsake me. Please hold me by the hand. Don't let me stumble and make some stupid mistake that will ruin my whole life work. Now, let's get serious. What were these men who worked 80, 90 hours a week, who paid their tithes faithfully, yes. who really were spending their life in leadership of this church? Yes. No motels, no fancy highways, making terrific No trips. restaurant meals even. They just ate a lunch. Why would these good men be afraid of what young Jones and Wagner were saying? Well, the only possible answer is they were immersed in the Old Covenant. They had never really understood the New Covenant. They loved the Sabbath. Yes, they, they kept the Sabbath. But there was egocentric concern that motivated them. They now hadn't watch that. You, you, you explain yourself there. Well, egocentric concern. They had given up real estate on this earth hoping to get real estate in heaven. And I'm not saying it's wrong to have a desire to be saved and to have a mansion in the New Jerusalem. But the nearer you come to the cross of Christ, the less you're going to think about that mansion in the New Jerusalem. The love which is agape, and when John said in 1 John 4, 8 that God is agape, he used that word, God is love, he used that word agape. It's an entirely different kind of love than what we human beings know on this earth. Like Philadelphia. Love yeah, that. that's, that's philos. Philos is just family affection, which is very nice. It's nice, of course. Agape is a kind of a love. Agape is a kind of a love that dares to go to hell for to save somebody else. And that's what Christ did on his cross. And our, see, I'm still, I, I was born a Lutheran, and then I attended the Presbyterian and Methodist churches. I love these people in these Sunday-keeping churches still. Bless their hearts. It's not their fault. They don't see what happened on the cross because they believe in the pagan papal doctrine of natural immortality. They cannot conceive of how Christ, when he died on that cross, actually died the world's second death. Christ poured out his soul unto death, Isaiah 53, verse 12. He emptied himself, Philippians 2, verse 5 and 6 like you drain a bottle of the last drop. He, he gave everything, even his eternal life. When he cried out on the cross, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
it seemed to him the Father had forsaken him. Truly. And he was willing to be forsaken by the Father Connect that if with he the could second save death. you and me. Connect that with the second death. Well, the second death is a death from which there was no, re no resurrection. It's the giving up of hope. Goodbye to life forever. And that is the consecration that Christ made for us. But the people who suffer the second death have been resurrected. But not to eternal life. Right. They have been resurrected to the judgment, yes. And it's interesting, 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that uh, uh, Christ, both resurrections are in Christ. True. Yeah. So even the wicked are resurrected in Christ, which uh, is a little insight into the reality that when Christ died upon the cross, he redeemed the world. But now, in the second resurrection, real time comes in. Reality is really in front of them. That's right. This is what they missed. In Revelation 20, verse 12, the books are opened. And all the secrets in those books are openly revealed. Why would that have to be? It has to be in order for the great controversy finally to be finished. Because if there is any lingering doubt of God's character of agape, of love, sin could be resurrected again. Or being unfair. Or being unfair, yes. And when the wicked finally see themselves as reality is and see how deeply selfish they have always been, how they have each one driven those spikes through Jesus' wrist bones and ankle bones, they crucified the Lord of glory. When that full realization dawns upon them, the pain is going to be worse in the fire of the lake of fire. And Ellen White tells us in Great Controversy that they will welcome destruction. And sometimes when I preach, I get carried away and I say, after the books are opened and this judgment takes place and the wicked finally realize who they are, that their name is Esau, they had the birthright in their hands. God had given it to them. It's not merely that God offered it to them. He gave it to them. They had it, and they threw it away. They sold it. They despised it. They're going to want to jump into the lake of fire. Sounds like Gethsemane all over again. <laughs> yes. And the 144,000 are going to go through Gethsemane on the right side. And they're going to pray just like Jesus did. Lord, not my will, but thine be done a complete crucifixion of self. Now, the general feeling among Seventh-day Adventists today is that kind of an experience is just beyond us. That's just impossible. Uh, no, we're not capable of going through Gethsemane like that. We'll just have to die and go in the grave and come up in the first resurrection. That's the underground route to heaven. That's the easy way to go. You get, even if you get cancer, you get drugs and they take away the pain. And I had a, a dear lady, used to be my secretary. She wrote me a letter last week. She's tired. She said, Robert and Grace, you know, I don't want to go through the time of trouble. I just want to die. Tired. And go to heaven that way. Well, she's old. I don't want to make her feel pained or anything like that. But when young people tell me that, I say, shame on you. You are depriving Christ of a witness he needs and he deserves exactly. in the last days. Exactly. Keep preaching it. Now, don't want to labor this too much, but when people awaken in the second resurrection, the real point of their anguish is that they resisted what yeah. God has been trying to give That's them. That's right. They and threw it away. Saying, and others have been saying for years, it's easier to be saved than to be lost. That's heresy. Careful. You better you work know, that out. As a good Adventist minister, 
you should tell people how hard, how how many sacrifices, how, how steep the, the, the hill is you have to climb. That's what most Adventist ministers believe is their duty to tell people. It's horrible. But the 1888 message came up with an entirely different idea. Okay, how that worked? When you understand how good the good news is, when you come to appreciate what faith is, as Ellen White defined it, faith is a heart appreciation of what it cost the Son of God to save us. When you realize what He's done for you, then this love, this agape of Christ constrains you. And the word constrain doesn't mean to, to hold you back. It means to push you forward. I could almost say it drives you into a life of total self-sacrificing ministry for the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15, when he says the love of Christ constrains us, because we thus judge. Like you figure 2 plus 2 equals 4. All right, judge this thing out. If one died for all, that means all died when he died. And when you realize you belong in that eternal grave, you, you, you deserve eternal death. And you realize the Lord Jesus, your elder brother, took it from you to give you eternal life instead, then that love will constrain you to live not for self, but for him who died for you and rose again. That's why it's easy to be saved and hard to be lost, but I don't put a period there. If you understand how good the good news is. Does that make sense? It makes sense to me because I can't understand the gospel in any other way. Uh, of course, self-denial is a, is a constant daily experience. We repent daily. There's some TV programs that I used to watch a year ago that are perfectly fine. No, nothing wrong with them whatsoever. I don't have time to watch them anymore. I, I'm repenting of wasting my time on something I could be doing something better in. It's a constant repenting, growing experience. And so I am resisting self-denial. But man, I have all the angels in heaven and the Holy Spirit to help me do it. When I'm doing something, choosing to do something a little less than the best, I don't have the Holy Spirit helping me. I'm on my own. But when I'm choosing something that the Lord wants me to do, I got, I got the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the way I look at it personally. You know, and that's, a, that's enough for me. When we kneel down with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and stay awake, which Peter, James, and John didn't do. But if by God's grace we can stay awake in the Garden of Gethsemane, it will become easy for us to deny self and follow Christ. See, that's the whole point of sealing as far as I'm concerned. I believe it. Because sealing is simply developing neural patterns that make it easier to say yes the next time or say no to the next time, whatever happens to be appropriate. Mm -hmm. When I was learning typewriting, I tell you, that was a, a beast for me. No, you know, no letters on the keys, no numbers. And you had to look up at the blackboard and, and there's a, a, a big A, B, C, D up there and you're trying to find them down here. Mm -hmm. I knew I'd never pass that course. Mm -hmm. Weeks went by and I was getting 10 words a minute, you know. But you know, I can type 70 and 80, 90 words a minute now. Good. And I never even look at the keys. Mm -hmm. Why? Because my neural patterns all those pathways were in the right place because of repetition, because of doing it over and over again. And when you choose to be a loving, kind, gracious person over and over again, by the grace of God, you will become a spontaneously natural kind of gracious person. Every temptation that strikes you will meet with the same response, condemns sin in the flesh.
And the more Bhutan you build up condemning, it's going to be easier until yes. it's no problem. That's why it's easier to be saved. I believe it. You build up those neural pathways. So God can trust you forever because your neural pathways are so built in, you'll never say no to him again. Well, that idea of it being easier to be saved than it is to be lost was, to me, a totally new idea. I went all the way through senior college, went all the way through the seminary, and I never heard that proclaimed until I read it in the writings of Jones and Wagoner. Both of them had that idea. I agree, and I pick it up in Steps to Christ or a number of places, the same wording. Well, it's in um, Thoughts on the Mount of Blessing, page 139. It's a very clear statement because most people have the idea that Ellen White um, specializes in telling how hard it is to follow Jesus. People have that idea mm -hmm. that she just makes it as boring and difficult as possible. They're not but reading in, her. Well, not as, as much as they should. But there on page 139, she says, do not conclude that the upward path is a hard path and the downward path is the easy way. All the, along the way that leads to eternal life, no, all, the, all along the way that leads to eternal death, there are pains and penalties, there are warnings not to go on. God's love has made it hard for the heedless and headstrong to destroy themselves. Close quote. I tell you, Bob, my own personal experience, uh, looking at it from the 1888 experience too, and just watching myself learn more of the great controversy theme and watch Ellen White expand it for me. It's made me into a very quiet, happy person. I couldn't be happier knowing what I know right today. Thank the Lord. And somehow the Lord has placed it upon all of us who want to respond to his simple invitation to make that happiness known. It's, it's happier yeah. to be following the truth wherever it leads. And I've got this conviction that if only we would let our people know what is this most precious message. And they understood it. They would produce the most efficient evangelism we have ever dreamed of. Because every church member who accepts this most precious message will become an evangelist in spite of himself. The old lady is going to share the message across the fence with the neighbors, for because example. Because they're happy for the first time in their yeah. life. And the ones who teach the boys and girls in the cradle roll and in the kindergarten and primary divisions, instead of preaching old covenant ideas, are going to be giving them this exuberant, joyous message of the new covenant. And the Pathfinder Club will be All transformed. right, Bob, I think it's come to the time when I want you to explain in more detail what you mean by the difference between the Old and New Covenant. 